Jones, and I swam the seven seas. Good afternoon and happy Memorial Day weekend. This is Ernie Powell, and this is the 21st edition of uh, the campaign with Ernie, with Ernie Powell on Radio Titans. Um, as, as I've talked about before, the theme of this show is not only the issues we talk about, the compelling public policy issues that we talk about around equality, justice, around um, keeping people economically secure and secure in their health care as they age, but the, but, the, but the other core theme of our show, because it's called the campaign, is how do we do the best tactical and strategic actions to build organizations on, the, um, on progressive issues to make those organizations effective. So the people that we talk to are the people that actually work day to day, week to week, month to month, um, building those kinds of campaigns, building those kinds of organizations, and doing the work to win big fights against this terrible conservative tide that we've seen for so too many years in our country. So um, it's about just it's not just about the issues, it's also about how we win on issues. We are particularly pleased and frankly very, very honored to have today's guest with us. It, she is Terry O'Neill. She is a president of NOW, and we will come back in just a minute and talk to Terry O'Neill, the president of NOW. We'll be right back. It's end I cannot see. Well, I fought in the jungles and I fought in the streets. But the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. Well, once I had a reason, don't know what it could be. And the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. Okay, we're back. And as I said, we're uh, our guest today, and she's talking to us all the way from, I believe, Maryland, where she lives, is Terry O'Neill, who is the president of the National Organization for Women. Let me give you a little bit about my personal background with Terry. I met her about three, four years ago because I was the national director of the Nas uh, for, for grassroots for the National Committee to Preserve Social Security. She sits on that board, and we work together on a number of issues impacting Social Security and Medicare. Um, she's, she became one of my favorite people as I lived and worked for Washington for a couple of years. And she became one of my favorite people because she works hard. She's very committed to the social justice issues that we all care about. Um, before I, in, before we, we, we talk to Terry, let me give you a little bit of, of her background because it's fascinating. Um, she got her start in politics in the early 1990s when David Duke of the KKK ran for governor of Louisiana. At the time, she was a professor of law at Tulane University in New Orleans. She signed on with the Stop Duke campaign and contributed by going door to door in her uptown uh, neighborhood, getting out the vote um, against Duke. Uh, the following year, she joined NOW. She served on NOW's, as NOW's vice president for membership from 2001 to 2005. She taught feminist legal theory and international women's rights law, corporate law, and legal ethics at Tulane and the UC Davis uh, School of Law, which is right next to one of my favorite places, Sacramento, California. She's a past president of Louisiana NOW, Maryland NOW, and New Orleans NOW, and member of... Um, She's a member of, where's the rest of my description? Member of the National Racial Diversity Committee. She served on the now national board representing the Mid-South region and the Mid-Atlantic region um, during the years before she became president. She was elected uh, president in 2000, July 2009 and still holds that position. She is a nationally renowned leader. I see her all the time on MSNBC. Um, she's a very strong spokesperson for social justice issues and the rights and equality of women in this society. So welcome to the campaign with Ernie Powell, Terry. It's great to talk with you, Ernie. So let's start off with um, 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 the way NOW is organized and how you've used your local chapters and state affiliates, etc., to be effective on the ground, given um, the pressures that we see to roll back many of the rights won in the last 20, 30 years that women have, that women have won. You know, I often call now the grassroots arm of the women's movement, um, by which I mean we don't actually provide services. We don't, we're not a research shop. We're not even a, a Washington, D.C. lobby shop. We do everything through the grassroots. We have 250 chapters around the country. That includes uh, about 35 very active state organizations. 
Um, we actually have uh, 51 total state organizations because we recognize the District of Columbia as a state. We hope the United States will do that at some point. So that we operate through the grassroots. If we're if we're advocating on a piece of federal legislation, for example, instead of sending some inside the Beltway person to Capitol Hill, we send the information to our grassroots leaders, to our elected leaders at the grassroots level. They're the ones who have gone door to door to elect their members of Congress. So they're the ones that we want talking to uh, the staff and the members of Congress about the particular legislation. It's really, it's, it's, uh, of course, you need all different types of organizations doing this advocacy work. But the grassroots piece is what now I think is really good at. It's, uh, it's, it's what we have honed over the years. And, um, and, and quite honestly, our chapters are both, they are autonomous, but also collaborative. And it is that sort of mix of chapters that decide what they're going to work on and then collaborate across state lines. They collaborate up and down, uh, you know, the levels of subunits of now um, to, to get a focused um, uh, campaign going. And quite frankly, Social Security is a perfect example of that. You know, I want to, if I could probe on this, on this, because it really fascinates me. As you know, I've worked in the senior, I'm going to call it the senior movement, for about 25 years, um, and how did how did you come up with this model? Because I have to tell you that it is a model that it's much different than most organizations that I know. You know, it is, and it it, it stems honestly in part from the believe it or not the 1970s consciousness raising groups that sprung up around the country in feminist circles. Uh, these these consciousness raising groups. Um, uh, were dedicated to really two things. Number one, um, noticing that individual women who felt um, curtailed, who felt that they couldn't get ahead in their job, or they they just they were not being they were not able to make the kind of contribution to their community that they felt uh, they could make. They began to meet in groups and realize it was a systemic problem. And all their lives they had been brought up to believe that it was only on them individually. So the consciousness raising was really aimed at saying, you know, let's identify the parts that are actually systemic. Let's identify how this is really not a personal thing. This is actually a political problem, and it, and it requires a political solution. And how do you get to a political solution is you have to organize. You have to elect the right people who will put the right policies in place. And when you elect them, then you have to organize to hold their feet to the fire. And it really, so, so this, this kind of community-based, very autonomous uh, groups actually did come out of, um, out of the consciousness, consciousness raising movement of, of, the femin, of the women's movement. And I think it was also accompanied by, at the same time that this was going on in the 60s and 70s, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. It was a I breakthrough, it. I it. yeah, I medical it book, the point of which was to encourage women to become partners with their health care providers and not treat the doctor like God, treat the doctor like the professional that she or he is working together with the patient to have the best outcomes. So that, again, the, you, in the 60s and 70s, women were really taking on responsibility for uh, becoming leaders in their communities and, and, uh, and exercising their own judgment. Uh, and understanding that while professional expertise has a place, it is not the be-all and end-all. The individual uh, woman has a right and a responsibility to engage in her community to help make the community better. And so then how that works out in the National Organization for Women is you have 250 chapters around the country. Each one of them individually actually decides what programs they're going to pursue. Um, and some of them are very much focused on ending violence against women because that's what's going on in their community. That's what's salient in their community. Some of them are very focused on um, economic security for older women. Some of them are very focused on keeping abortion clinics safe and open. Some are very focused on doing reproductive rights from a social justice perspective, ensuring that every woman has the right to have the children she wants and raise the children she has free of violence and coercion. So, so all different, you know, it's like, it's like um, I think it was Mozart who said, many, many, many different musical instruments making a very lovely symphony. Can I, I'd like to stay with this for just a minute because it fascinates me, and it also helps me reflect on... Um, 
frankly, on the book that I'm writing, which is about the senior movement. Um, so what happens in this system when you've got a national issue and you need to mobilize everybody? Does, does, everybody, have, does everybody weigh in? How, how, do you, how do you do that? I know. You know, we, we don't require chapters to weigh in, but we do give them the opportunity okay. to weigh in. And, and back under the Bush administration, when George Bush, after the 2004 election, the first time he actually got elected uh, by the people of this country to be president, as opposed to being appointed by the Supreme Court. So after 2004, he gets elected and he announces he's going to use all of his political capital to privatize Social Security. Right. And the entire left spectrum, um, of the entire you know, left part of the political spectrum mobilized, and that includes the women's movement, and now is very much part of it. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we made the case, we made the feminist case for not privatizing Social Security. And that was in, what, 2004, 2005? 2004, 2005, 2006, yeah. In there. Then, then fast forward, the, the economy crashes in 2008, and President Obama is elected in 2009. And somehow, instead of holding Wall Street accountable for driving our economy off a cliff, is a bunch of Wall Streeters who wanted to hold Social Security uh, to blame for for the problems in the in the economy, and they wanted to start cutting Social Security benefits, not privatizing, cutting benefits. We mobilized again early, and that's where you and I met. Mm -hmm. Is in that in that huge effort to stop the effort to cut. Now chapters around the country had all they already had a major cognitive base for doing this kind of work. So it really wasn't hard for the national office to produce the materials. You know, we hired one organizer whose only job was to work on Social Security, and she energized uh, chapters all around the country. We don't require it, but many of them dove in and, and began creating partnerships at the ground level with, uh, with union organiza organizations like the Association of Retired Americans, with the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, uh, with AAUW, the American Association of University Women, which got involved. So all around the country, what you had was very fierce, community-based activism to stop the cuts to Social Security. And it was amazing because we had the Democrats in Congress, some Democrats in Congress, and nearly all Republicans in Congress against us. There was, as I recall, won. yeah, and, and, and that's right, and you did win. Um, so here, I guess what you're saying is that you would pre-prepare it almost uh, through this strong grassroots network to then, to then move forward and execute on a campaign. Is that kind of the core point? That's exactly right. We provide the information to our chapter leaders, but they know what to do with it. Um, and, and in the meantime, it, you know, when, when, uh, when there's not a big major, um, I guess you could say, crisis, which the, the threat to Social Security in, in, in 2010, 11, and 12 was, was at crisis level, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. When there's not a crisis going on, these local communities are doing their own thing, keeping their skills up, bringing in more people, uh, writing letters to the editor, engaging in their local communities. So they have the skills going in when you have to have a major national push. So let, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit globally for a minute, because this show, as I said earlier in the introduction, is about organizing and how to organize effectively. And so let's, the lesson that I want an, an organizer to get who's listening to this somewhere out in the world and listening to a pre, a, an amazing progressive leader, and I'm talking about you, is that the grassroots really can count, and the grassroots are actually the essence from which one is most effective. What always made me nervous, what's always made me nervous in all the years I've been with the senior movement, and I've been, and I've, and I've pushed on, on the grassroots point in every, in every position I've had, was that people thought that if you sent, and I'll just be sarcastic for a minute, only to make the point, and I do respect lobbyists, but if you sent a suit in to talk to a congressman member that you were showing that congressman power, the congress member power, when in fact what you're saying is that the suit may help, but that that the people themselves designing designing and weighing in on the issues and then moving the grassroots is ten times more effective. Is that a fair conclusion? Absolutely, Ernie. I mean, the suits are important. You have to have that because the suits not only um, look powerful, but they have the deep uh, legislative analysis. They have the wonky, the deeply wonky stuff. But you know, the other thing they've got, Terry. <laughs> the other Sorry. Thing, the other thing they've got is the big credit card that takes everybody to lunch after the meeting. But that, never mind on that. 
Yeah, right. Well, on the left, they don't have that many credit cards. Yeah. <laughs> but True. they got some nice suits down yeah. the left, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you, but so, so the suits alone are not going to do it. It has to be backed up with on-the-ground work. Look, the members of Congress have to get elected in their local yeah. communities. Yeah. If they've got local community activists unhappy with them, they feel it very quickly. Um, even if the local community activists are not going to come in with billions of dollars. Um, and, and I do think that, that we are we have already moved into an era where the dollars uh, are threatening to drown out the grassroots, but they, do, they have not, the dollars have not drowned out the grassroots yet. And quite frankly, there's a lot of technology around that is elevating grassroots yeah. voices. Yeah. Have you read, and I don't know, I, I can't imagine you and I haven't talked about this because we've had some marvelous conversations in the last few years. Have you read Starfish and Spider? I have, yes, yes. It's wonderful. A wonderful uh, book. Yeah, well, me, absolutely. And, Fascinating. And, and check me on this, but check me on this, um, because I really trust your, your expertise. I haven't read it in a while, but everything, you, as, as you were talking, I kept thinking about that book. This is a, ma- it's actually sort of a management book written by two authors uh, from the, the, the Bay Area, and they basically say that leaderless organizations are much more effective than leader-based organizations. And they use as examples, they, they talk about the sort of literal and real lives of a starfish and a spider. And a starfish, if, they, if, if a starfish loses a part of its body, it simply multiplies. If a, if, if a spider, a spider is completely dependent upon the head. And if they lose the head, they're dead. And mm-hmm. so what they do then is they, then, then they, do an ana- they talk about that and then they do an analysis of various organizations. And, and, and the way to best understand this is to ask um, if anybody knows who the leader of Alcoholics Anonymous is. And, of course, no one does. And right. my, my point being is that, 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 the, that one of the ultimate and best executed um, um, starfish models is, is Alcoholics Anonymous. They talk about... Uh, they talk about a number of other organizations and movements through the years that were had leaders, but the leaders were facilitators, and the leaders were people that were catalysts, and that's a word that they use a lot. So, you know, I, this might be some, this on a, at another time um, in another venue. This might be a longer discussion for you and I, but this sounds like what you all are doing um, as a as a model. And going back to how progressive organizations can use this. The key is to say that the power is in the people and the power, the more that the people are making decisions, um, the more you can build a progressive organization that then leads to progressive wins. Do you, and you, you agree with that assumption, I would imagine. You know, I absolutely do. I mean, I understand how the right wing, and let's take, for example, the, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They don't come much more right wing than those guys. No kidding. And let me just say that I understand they do some work uh, with poor people, but they create so much poverty by their vicious anti-woman policies that I really have lost a lot of my respect for their anti-poverty work. Um, I, that, that's me being extremely opinionated. But look at how centralized they are and how incredibly powerful they are. The way the Catholic hierarchy um, advances its political agenda is through money. They, they have a ton of money, and they spend that money in part in, po- in, in advancing a political agenda as well as a cultural agenda. That's one model. The left will never have that kind of money. Now, if you don't have those kinds of resources, you've got to figure out how to have what I think of as sort of multinodal leadership groups. I don't, I mean, I really wouldn't call now's chapters leaderless, not at all. In fact, we're very small d democratic. Every chapter elects its leaders every year. It's an election process. Um, and, and those leaders have response, have real responsibilities for leadership. Mm-hmm. But, but they are, but the leaders are not selected centrally. They are selected, they are elected by the grassroots. So, so on the left, if you don't have a lot of resources, but you do have fabulous ideas, you do have ways of really moving the entire country forward, then the, 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 the starfish and the spider model, I think, is really great. And you're right, the, the, the top leadership of now, a, a major responsibility of the national office is to get the information out to the elected leadership, because we know the elected leadership will know what to do with that information. It's not like we're telling them, um, go here 
here, go here, go here. What we're giving them is, here's some sample letters to the editor. Here's some, mm-hmm. here's some basic talking points. Now you have to fill in the blanks about what's going on in your community. And then you know how to talk to your member of Congress because you elected that person and so forth. Well, this is fascinating, and I hope that people that are listening can sort of take the lesson that, you're, that, that, the lesson that I'm getting from you around the importance of, of engagement, the importance of grassroots power, and that one needs to, and, and, and that is the core element in an orga, any organization we build. I'm going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to start to talk about how the, your, your, your organization then works on given issues and what the challenges are um, given, um, um, given the, the atmosphere right now, if you will, of this country. So we're with Terry O'Neill. She's president of the National Organization for Women. We'll be right back. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell. Well, I sang to myself that I want to be free, but the road I must travel, its end I cannot see. I walked the empty desert and was burned. Okay, welcome back. I'm with um, my good friend Terry O'Neill, who is president of the National Organization for Women. Terry. Uh, again, we thank you for joining us today. We know how busy your schedule is. Um, what I'd like to shift to now is some issues. How does how, and, and let's talk first about um, the big retirement issues or the big, if you will, economic and health security issues that women face across the country in Social Security and Medicare. So let me ask a basic question. Are those two programs pulling, pushing us towards bankruptcy? And why do we hear that so much? And how do those statements impact uh, women as they age? They're absolutely not pushing us towards bankruptcy. In fact, the Social Security system is what is keeping most families out of bankruptcy right now. Mm-hmm. And I say that because, uh, because progressively over the past 30 years, employers have ceased creating pensions, actual pensions for employees. So your only, your only really steady income in your retirement years, not the only, but the most important steady income in retirement years is from Social Security for, for the vast majority of people in this country. Um, so we know the system is strong, but, but the claims that it is going bankrupt are a cynically intentional um, set of misrepresentations intended to reduce confidence in the system. The Social Security system has not missed a payment in 76 years. That's why people believe in it so strongly. So what you have on the right is people constantly saying it's going broke, it's going broke, it's going broke, to try to stop people from believing in it. Um, The good news is that American voters are not that easily fooled, and they have not been fooled. They know that it's stronger. But there are some real stresses on the system. Besides the, the, the misleading propaganda from the right, one of the real stresses is, uh, has, has been put out by a, a, a researcher named Ben Vegti. It's, uh, if you go to socialsecurityworks.org, if your listeners go there, there's a fascinating paper where he traces the fact that because of skyrocketing inequality and income inequality, a larger and larger portion of incomes are not going into the social security system. Right, most people don't know that there is a cap on the wages. Like most of us, pay six point two percent of our wages go into the Social Security system. But anything you earn over like one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, that doesn't go into the system at all. Which means that the wealthiest, you're making a million dollars a year, you're paying zero point zero six or something percent of your income, where all the rest of us are paying six point two percent of our income into the system. All wages need to be going into the system. But Ben Zekti puts out, points out that it's not just wages. It's that increasingly, because Wall Street has become so bloated and, and, and so overpaid, a lot of Wall Street incomes are not going into the system at all because it's passive income. It's not wages. So what we need to do is get all incomes, passive income as well as wages, going into the Social Security system. Everybody needs to pay their fair share. Mm -hmm. A flat tax is already regressive. What we have is a re-re-re-re-regressive system where it's not even a flat tax on all of us. needs to be at least a flat tax on all of us. And then coming out of the system, the benefits are steeply progressive. That's the way it should be. 
very steeply progressive where the benefits are going to make sure that people don't have to live out their last years um, in poverty and indignity. It's a pretty simple concept, and it's one that the vast majority of people in this country support. Um, and and it, we just need to make a few tweaks to Social Security to, to increase the benefits, enhance benefits, and enhance its strengths, and we'll be good to go for the next 100 years. And, if I may add... Um, and I just want to share with you something that that when I was when I was at ARP and we fought in 2005 on the Bush proposal for privatization, and I would talk about the cap and I would talk about the disparities and the unfairness of the cap. I would use as illustration, and I think you know that I love baseball, and I would use as illustration that the and I picked on Barry Bonds for reasons that I don't even know that <laughs> by, by, by the fifth by his second at bat he this is. I, I, and I did this once mathematically. I took the number of times he went up to bat, and I divided that by his salary. By his second at bat, he was done paying his Social Security tax for the entire baseball season. And so, so the point, the point being is I, I, I'm very clear on that disparity, and I agree with you a lot. Let me, let me go back to the confidence issue. So, even, um, social, so, so one of the arguments that we used, again, I was, when I was with ARP was about confidence, because we found that the confidence issue, as you said a moment ago, was the one that the conservative movement was using the most, because they couldn't say that Social Security was a bad idea, because it was too popular. But there was so much lack of confidence in the government, so they would, they would weigh in and say, it's going broke, it's going broke, you're never going to see it. And so we said, it's not perfect, but it's not broken either, and it can pay, pay full benefits. And at that point, it was for the next 30 years. And even then, it pays 73%. Of promised benefits, I guess the core, the core point, uh, not to belabor this, is that Social Security is not in crisis. Social Security is in very good shape, and even with modest economic growth, it pays full benefits for 30 years. And even at that point, it it has a it has a minor shortfall. Now, the best remedy that you're talking about, the best remedy to equalize what you just so wisely called a flat tax, is to even the playing field. And tax it, and tax, and you're saying, and it's essentially scrap the cap, and um, and and have all income um, taxed uh, on behalf of the social security system. Is that essentially your point? Yes, we have to go beyond wages. You know, um, in 2010 and 2011, um, those of us in the coalition to, to strengthen Social Security were saying, scrap the cap, scrap the cap. <clears throat> and we clearly still support that. But, but new analysis has convinced me that not only must we scrap the cap, we must include passive income in the system as well. That's the only way to make it fair. And let's talk about the impact on women and how it, how it fits with the income disparities, the lifetime of earnings is substantially lower than men, um, et cetera, et cetera. So how does all of this conversation impact women um, in their day-to-day lives? Exactly. I mean, Social Security really is a feminist issue, Ernie, because, in fact, uh, women work a lifetime at unequal pay. Uh, on average, women are earning about 78 cents to the dollar paid to men. But for women of color, um, it's really stark. It's, it's something like um, 64 cents to the dollar for African-American women. For Latinas, it's more like 59 cents mm-hmm. to the dollar um, that Latinas are paid compared to white men. Why is that? Well, it's because women uh, cluster in lower paid occupations uh, throughout the economy. In fact, two-thirds of minimum wage workers in the United States are women two-thirds of minimum wage workers. And the reason that two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women is because 70% of tipped workers are women. Mm -hmm. 70%. And And the federal minimum wage for tipped workers is a shocking $2.13 an hour. It assumes then, you know, let's just, let me probe on that for a minute. It's, It's $2 and how much an hour? $2.13 $2.13 an hour. Making the assumption that the rest of it is made up with tips? Yes. Yes, exactly. 
there's a woman named Saru Jai Raman. She teaches at Berkeley. She is the head of the Restaurant Opportunity mm-hmm. Centers United, um, which was an organization that she helped to found in New York City. Now she's out on the West Coast, and Rock United is throughout the country. They've got, uh, they've got chapters in many uh, cities around the country. Um, she's been doing research, and what she has, what her research has shown is that the concept of tipping workers instead of paying workers arose out of the slave system of the United States. After the Civil War, after uh, slavery was abolished, um, uh, subsequent to the Civil War, uh, the, the argument began to be made for Pullman porters on the railroads that they didn't need a wage, that they, these were mostly African-American men who were accustomed to working without wages, and their customers could simply pay them a tip. And hence comes the concept of tipping workers. Today, most tipped workers are women. The vast majority of tipped workers are women. These are waitresses. These are women who work in nail salons mm-hmm. um, and, and so forth. They're living on tips, and they're not living on tips at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. They're living on tips at Olive Garden and Denny's, right, and IHOP. In fact, on average, women working at those, uh, at those chain restaurants, including tips, are bringing in about 5 to $6 an hour. Wow. 5 to $6 an hour. Wow. It's outrageous. And so, and so what, that ha- what happens is you work a lifetime at low-wage jobs. And by the way, here's the other thing. You have less money coming in the door because you're working at a low-wage job. You've got a lot more money going out the door because you're working at a low-wage job. The low-wage jobs don't come with employer-sponsored health care. Mm-hmm. They don't come with other employer-sponsored benefits. So you're paying out of pocket for your own health care. You're paying out of pocket for your children's health care, and women are vastly more likely to be financially responsible for children than men are. You're paying out of pocket very often for your parents' care, right? And, and so you have less money coming in, more money going out. By the time a woman gets to her retirement years, she is very heavily uh, dependent on her quite meager Social Security income. But without Social Security, over half of women in, in this country over the age of 65 would be living in poverty. And 90% As are, it is, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. As it is, 90% are out of poverty. Right, right. And I was going to say 90% of, I think I read that 90% of women on Social Security depend on it for more than 50% of their income. Oh, yes, yes. And for African-American women over the age of 70, uh, the vast majority actually rely on Social Security for 100% of their income. So let's, if we could, shift um, to the importance of Medicare. And I just want to report, um, despite what we heard in 2010, um, that all the buildings that surround where I am, are still standing. Remember they said that all the buildings in the world would fall down because of Obamacare? Because it was (laughs) still... Yes. And the sky was falling, and I still see a sky. Um, And uh, so a lot of that, those predictions were crazy. And that there was a $750 billion billion theft of Medicare. Um, All those lies were so destructive and so wrong and so stupid. But here's my point, or here's my question for you, Terry. Let's talk a little bit about Improvements to Medicare through the through the through Obamacare, and we know there were some. We know there are improvements to the solvency challenge, and and also the this the impact of cuts to Medicare. What that would do um, to, re- to to working women as they retire and to women currently retired. Yeah, you know, one of the the uh, Medicare is extremely important. In fact, if I could be in the Medicare system today, I would be. My mom was on Medicare. I handled her um, her finances for a while, and uh, it was it was a fabulous system. It was seamless. It was easy. You know, she did have a Medigap policy to supplement her Medicare mm-hmm. benefits, but it was it was really a wonderful system. In fact, Medicare has the by far the least amount of. Um, Administrative costs associated with it compared with private insurance. Less, less than two percent. Less than two percent. We we really should have Medicare for all in this country. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons that it's so important for women is that, in fact, as they age, women are more likely than men to have what we call co-occurring morbidities, 
which simply means you've got a couple of things wrong with you, more than one. Maybe it's, it's, it's a heart disease and high blood pressure. Maybe it's high blood pressure and diabetes. Maybe it's diabetes and kidney trouble. So it's, it's co-occurring things for which you need ongoing uh, medical care. Women are more likely to have that. Women of color are far more susceptible to stress-related long-term um, uh, disease processes like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease, and that requires ongoing care. So Medicare is deeply important. What the, what, what the, the right-wing dominated House of Representatives is trying to do to Medicare right now, and, and they've, they've made some incremental gains along these lines, is, is increasingly make it more and more and more expensive for ordinary people to get their Medicare coverage. The, the co-pays would go up, and you've got to pay more for your, um, for your uh, pharmaceutical coverage, for your, for your medicines, and so forth. And that's devastating to women who don't have savings right. to right. fall back on. Right. And um, but we remember some of the improvements that were made through Obamacare, closing, uh, closing the donut hole. Um, which didn't happen fast enough, right. but still is, but is incrementally um, happening, and finally gets closed by by 2020, 2020, as well as some additional benefits and additional preventative care, as I recall. Um, so, right, go ahead. which I'm is sorry. extremely important. Which is extremely important. Okay, Terry, you're, this is amazing. Um, I want to shift now in a minute after we take a short break to some other issues that NOW is working on. So once again, I'm so pleased to have our good friend Terry O'Neill, president of the National Organization for Women, on. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Burned in the heat of the road I must travel Its end I cannot see I cross the frozen wasteland In the bitter cold did freeze And the road I must travel it's end I cannot see, and I will knock on every door, for I do not have a key. And the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. Well, I sang to myself that I want to be free, but the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. Okay, we're back. Once again, this is Ernie Powell, with the, and this is the, um, the campaign with Ernie Powell on Radio Titans. Um, I'm so pleased and honored to have my good friend Terry O'Neill, president of NOW, with us. She's talking to us from, her, uh, from Washington, D.C. So tell us, if you could, Terry, now that we've covered some of the key retirement and um, economic and health security issues for women, um, tell us what your, some of your core, um, your core priorities right now, given... Um, some of the many, many, many threats to to uh, to w women's rights happening in the states and at the federal level. What are, what are your big fights? What are your big campaigns? How can people help? So uh, the biggest fights right now that we have are economic justice for women and reproductive health care justice for women. Um, at the state level, the the attacks on women's reproductive health care access are just jaw-dropping. We've had over 300 anti-abortion bills dropped at the state level in 2015 alone, and it's not even June yet. It's, it's, it's really outrageous. I don't know if many of your listeners are familiar with the uh, Pervy Patel case. as a young woman who experienced a miscarriage. Uh, she had told friends she did not want to be pregnant. She had tried to obtain an abortion, but be she lived in Indiana, and Indiana has a complex and debilitating web of restrictions against women's access to reproductive health care generally. She was not able to, um, to access abortion care. She ultimately suffered a miscarriage. She has been sentenced to 20 years in prison because the Indiana authorities convinced a judge that she was responsible for that miscarriage. No. And, and under very murky uh, sets of evidence that, the, that we don't believe hold water. There's a, there's a wonderful um, free pervy movement on rhrealitycheck.org. But, but what we're doing in now is we're very policy-focused. <clears throat> there's a federal bill um, called the Women's Health Protection Act that would put a stop to these webs of anti-reproductive uh, health care laws. They don't criminalize abortion per se. What they do is create so many barriers that women can't access 
the health care they need when they need it. That is hugely impactful for women because, again, maybe you have to go out of state to get your care and you're paying out of pocket. What, on 59 cents to the dollar? Mm -hmm. You're going to pay out of pocket for your health care? It's completely outrageous. So you can see that access to health care is in itself a human right that is being abridged all around the country. And that's that's, um, that's really at crisis proportions for women. You know, it has an economic impact. Absolutely. Did you see the um, Rand Paul statement this morning about the right to health care? No, I did not. Classic Rand Paul. I, I, I was flipping through stuff, getting ready for for um, getting ready for the rest of my day this morning. I happened to run across a rant. He, he said that, oh, I don't even want to repeat it. It's so offensive. He said that if you want to say that you have a right to health care, then I'm a doctor, and that means you have a right to come to my home, arrest me, and force me to give you that health care. Yeah, see, like so many so-called libertarians, Rand Paul wants full freedom for himself, even if that means zero freedom for everybody else. He's got a freedom to make money off anybody. He's got a freedom to run his mouth however much he wants. He's got a freedom to do everything he wants. And if that includes making sure that nobody else can have their freedom, that's okay with libertarians like Rand Paul. That, frankly, is, is, a, is, is a reason why I am deeply suspicious of someone who says, you know, I'm all for freedom. You know, the reality is we live in society, and, uh, and, and taking freedom seriously means taking responsibility to make your entire community better. Right. That, I think, is what it means to live in a democratic society, and that's where we need to go. So let's go back to the, Indi- the Indiana case. And can you, you said that there's a special website where people can perhaps weigh in and help, perhaps give donations, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, it's rhrealitycheck.org. Okay. RH stands for Reproductive Health. It's a wonderful website. There, it's, it, you will find some of the best reporting and some of the best commentary on uh, on the current status of women's access to the full the full spectrum of women's uh, of reproductive health care services. It's a wonderful site. It, I'm a I'm a huge supporter of them. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell, and I can tell. Yeah. Talk to us more about other challenges to the women's movement, um, given um, this really tough political atmosphere. Yes, so the other piece is that we've got reproductive justice is a huge challenge, and the other piece is economic justice. And as, as I've said, the more you cut women off from access to health care, the more you are stressing their economic security. But wait, there's more. The Republican-dominated, and by the way, I have nothing against Republicans. I have family members. I have very good friends in the Republican Party. But the leadership of the Republican Party uh, is deeply, deeply um, right-wing, so extremist that it, it is it is – they would make our country truly dysfunctional. What they are trying to do to women's economic security is particularly heinous. They have a budget that would increase spending on military at the expense of social um, services spending. Well, let's think about it. What kinds of social services do they want to cut? Why access to programs to, to prevent and redress violence against women and sexual assault? Programs for training uh, to get women and others into, non, into jobs where they haven't traditionally been welcome. Um, after school programs, child care programs, health care programs, making more health care available to people at low incomes. All of these programs are disproportionately utilized by women. And these are the programs that the Republican-dominated House and Senate are taking aim at. But think about that a little bit more. These very same programs are disproportionately employing women, social workers, educators, Mm -hmm. health care providers. These are very heavily uh, dominated by women. And when you shut down those programs, you lay off the women who work in those programs. So you're stopping the services that women need, and, you're, and you're laying women off that need the job. Exactly. So it's a double-edged, it's a double-edged evil, so to speak. Exactly. Exactly. How do you do it? <laughs> right. uh, Bang yeah. your head against the wall. <laughs> no, I got to tell you something. I'm just going to say this, and it just came to me, and and I it probably has come to me in subconscious ways. You know my life, and you know where I've been, Terry. We've been friends for a few years. And you know that I've worked with some pretty, I mean, I've started with Cesar Chavez as a, almost a teenager in California. Um, I had the opportunity to work closely with him. I've written about it. I've worked with other, uh, with other leaders throughout my lifetime, both in the, in the labor movement, in the social justice movement, 
and in the senior movement, I have ne I have rarely met somebody as hopeful and as hopeful and it, every time I meet you and see you, I feel better about m my life and I feel better about <laughs> what our causes are. And you are an, an, an amazing leader for all of us. And so let me go from the sort of whimsical to the serious. How do you do it? You know, Ernie, I, I honestly, sometimes I wonder, what am I doing in this job? But most days I wake up and think how truly fortunate I am, honestly, to be working um, at this moment. I really think the country is moving to a crossroads. I am so excited about the resurgence of, of progressive policies uh, throughout the country. I am so excited about the Twitterverse where women, and particularly young women of color, are coming into their own. They are taking a leadership role. Um, it was it was young women of color that created Black Lives Matter out mm -hmm. of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is so much good that is coming, and and I get that it is scary as hell. I mean, the Koch brothers, literally. If you look at all the research that's been done on the Koch brothers, I went to a presentation recently, and it's it's just deeply disturbing. They are making a run at the United States government. They intend to take over the United States government, and they mm -hmm. intend to do it with their billions of dollars. We're going to stop them, and we're going to stop them precisely because of Twitter and of this, this resurgence of progressive sensibility. And frankly, the, the, the Democratic Party is moving a little bit in the right direction on that. That's, yes, And we've got to I keep agree. pushing and pulling them in the right direction. So I feel like I've got a contribution to make. What can I tell you? And... and um, and it's exciting to be able to make that contribution. You know, the other person that I that I want to mention is um, is Dolores Huerta. Yes. And, and, yes. And I'm sure I'm sure she's a friend of yours. Um, I would call her a friend of mine. Um, I don't know her as well as I want to know her, but I've had so many remarkable moments, either from just watching her up on a stage giving a speech, or um, sometimes that we did work together over the years. And and you know, we have a president who campaigned with with a motto that that actually was was um, was was thought of by Dolores and by Dolores, yes, yeah, exactly. it, was, it was Dolores, and 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 and, and the motto is "Si se puede, si se puede, it can mm -hmm. be done," and it came out of a uh, of a meeting she was in with a group of farm workers where everybody was just saying, "We can't win this. That the growers are too powerful. We we don't have all the money." Whatever. And finally, she just got mad at him and just said, "Si se puede." Si se puede. In other words, she she laid down a hammer, um, mm -hmm. and, and and she weighed half as much as probably everybody in the room. Um, but right. she, she, you know, it's Dolores, and she used all that fire and all that kind of hopefulness, and that's where si se puede came from. And of course, we saw the 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 uh, Obama campaign use that as one of their yes. sort. Of, I hate to use the word brand, but as one of their mottos when he ran in two thousand eight. And again, I. Um, I just want to tell you that you got that same you got that same mojo. You are the essence of Cisse Puede, and we are so lucky to have you as a as a national leader. Um, Ernie, you could not give me a better compliment than to compare me to Dolores Huerta. She's an icon. She is such a role model and a real hero to mine. I, I to me, I have, um, I, you know, I have, I am, I do consider myself a friend of hers. I have worked with her, um, and she is, you know, she she is no end of optimistic. Well, and, let me let me tell you know, you know, we're on a radio show and we're supposed to be formal, but I'm going to stop being formal for a minute. Let me tell you a really great story between me and Dolores. When I was with ARP, this was something like oh. 2002, um, and you've seen me for years be in denial about my back problems, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you've seen me hobble and sometimes not hobble, but I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I, I wish I could, someday somebody's just, I got to buy a new back. So I was during one of those moments when my back was really killing me, and I had to walk about a block and a half from my apartment on Wilshire to a, a small or oratorium down the street where I was going to give a speech with Dolores Huerta, I think it was about Social Security. So uh -huh. ARP had gotten Dolores to come to this speech, and we were also honored and so also pleased. And so I walked into the room, and I was hobbling pretty bad. And, of course, we saw each other, and we remembered each other from the old days during the, during the Huelga and, De, and Delano and, and, the, and the original Great Boycott. And we'd seen each other through the years, so we did, you know, we hugged and said hello. But we had to get up on a stage, and there were no steps to the stage. It was just one maybe... I don't know, maybe a foot up, and for me, lifting my leg 
up there, given the way I was walking, was really painful and not easy. But I, Terry, I have an ego. And, and I didn't want to show it. I didn't want to show it. And I didn't want to show it in front of Dolores Huerta. But she saw it. So she stood next to me. And, you know, if I weigh 250 pounds, I don't even know if I'm telling the truth, but I weigh in that range. And Dolores is pretty small. You know, she probably weighs about 105 pounds. So yeah. she's standing next it's to dripping me. Dripping wet. Right. She's standing next to me. And she says, Ernie, put your hand on my shoulder. Mm. And I said, oh, Dolores, come on. I'm fine. I'm fine. She said, Ernie, put your hand on my shoulder. I said, Dolores, I'm okay. In the meantime, I'm saying, I don't know how I'm going to get up on the stage, but I am not going <laughs> to. Finally, she the third time, she's in, she cussed. You know, She said, damn it, Ernie, put your hand on my shoulder. I put my hand on Dolores Huerta's shoulder, and I got up on the stage. Oh, my God. And I, um, that's what we're doing, kid. That's what you yeah. and I and all of us are doing. So Yes. Yes, and, that's Dolores. Yeah, absolutely. That's Dolores. That 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 is that really sums her up. It's so perfect. But I'm saying that's what you're doing too. So on that note, I'm going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We are with Terry O'Neill, the president of the National Organization for Women. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back to wrap up with some final questions. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell on Radio Titans. We shot a man in Soho. Couldn't guess his age. I found his empty journal. I filled up every page. I called up my state senator. They said he wasn't there. The secretary took my name, and man, she sounded scared. So I counted my mis. Okay, we're back with Terry O'Neill. This has been a, a, an amazing conversation. Terry, let's talk about um, how people can can work with now, can become engaged in now, can join it. What's the website address and? Um, how do people begin to work with you and the rest of your organization, either in California or across the country? So the website to go to is now.org, www.now.org. If you're in California, go to uh, Google California Now. I think it's www.canow.org, but I'm not positive. Um, we have, as I said, we've got chapters in every state of the country, including Washington, D.C., no matter where you are, go to now.org, and it says, find your local chapter. If there isn't a local chapter, we'll work with you to start one up. Um, the, more, the more feminists we have out there in the community working for feminist causes, the better. Absolutely. Well, thank you for this. This was a solid hour and a very good hour for Radio Titans. Um, as I said, um, uh, you are a great friend and an incredibly important leader to um, all of these social justice and feminist issues that we all so strongly believe in. I, wanna, I know how important your time is, and I want to thank you for this interview, and I want to just ask you one question. At some point in the coming months, could we have you back? Oh, I would love to, anytime. Okay. It's great to talk with you, really. Absolutely. And you've got to come to California. We'll do a yes. tour. We'll do a tour yes. and talk about all these issues, and um, and um, and because and there's, I mean, you just got to come to fa- California, and I hope you could do that soon. Me too. I, you, you, you got it. We got, I got to get there before the end of the year, that's for sure. Absolutely. Terry O'Neill, we thank you for this great hour. We thank you for joining in on uh, the campaign with Ernie Powell. Keep up the good work, and we'll be in touch soon. This is Ernie Powell and the campaign with Ernie Powell and Radio Titans. Thank you again, Terry. Thank you. Fortunes, I added up the blame. I picked through all the garbage, I checked off all the names I read in the newspaper, they questioned all my friends They hoped that they could find my ass before I struck again So I sang to myself that I want to be free But the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see And so when thirsty I will drink, and when hungry I will steal But the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see Okay, that was a great interview. I so enjoyed meeting, or excuse me, talking with Terry O'Neill, the president of the National Organization for Women. What she is to me is a complete, I mean, I, she is such a strong leader, um, and I think she did a great job in terms of detailing the, the, the tough issues that that organization and that women face in this country. So this is the campaign with Ernie Powell. Um, uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks for, with additional guests, but I really encourage the listeners here to go to the website for now, um, get involved, get engaged either in a local chapter or at the national level. 
Um, this is one of the core economic security, uh, reproductive rights, uh, health security for women is a core progressive issue that we all have to fight for. No one does it better than Terry. Um, let's, 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 I encourage all of you to go to their website and get involved. Um, this has been a great show and a great pleasure to have our good friend from Washington, Terry O'Neill. I'm signing off now. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell. Thank you all. So tonight I walk in anger with worn shoes on my feet and the road I must travel. It's end I cannot see and I will sing to myself that I'm gonna be free. But the road I must travel.